Hey, good morning and welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Faith Church. We're so glad you're here. I think some of our kids are already back in school. Those who are not back in will be going in in a day or two. And we're excited, man, that you are here with us for worship this morning. Uh, in a minute, we're going to uh, ask you to stand to your feet and get ready for praise and worship. Jay and Jasmine are standing by and getting ready, but I want to just give you a peep into the Word that we're going to be bringing today. This is part two of a study that we started last week. It's called How You Treat the Church is How You Treat Jesus, and it's all based on the fact that Jesus is the bridegroom, the church, which is us, are the bride, and we're getting ready for a marriage feast because Jesus loves his people. Amen? Amen. So let's get ready now for praise and worship. Let's go to Jay and Jasmine Halsey in the name of Jesus. Stand to your feet. Amen. Good morning, Faith Church. We just want to declare right now that the Lord is good. Can anybody testify today that God is good, that he's awesome, that he's amazing, that he is faithful? Lord, we just bless you because you are good. Hallelujah.
worship you right now. Lord God, we thank you for life, health, and strength. Lord God, we thank you just for who you are, just for being God. We thank you for being consistent, even when we are inconsistent, Lord God. And Lord God, in this moment, we just want to take a second just to love on you, just to worship you, just to praise you for being so awesome and for being present in our lives. Right now, I cover each and every person under, under the sound of my voice right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I speak to strength to your people right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, I pray for the man of God as he comes forth to bring your word. I ask that you will just give him a word that will bless your people in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, I pray for his family. I pray for everyone that is connected to him right now in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we give you all thanks, praise, and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We hope that you have enjoyed this service. Worship service this far. Right now, we want to introduce our pastor and our man of God, Pastor Aubrey Miller. Well, good morning again. How you treat the church is how you treat Jesus. How many of you out there are married? Anybody engaged? Anybody single? Let me tell you a little secret. There are no single people in the body of Christ. All of us who are born again and who have been washed in the blood of Jesus, we are all betrothed. We are all engaged. Now, let me give a little bit of background on that because I don't want you to accept it until you accept the word. In the days of Christ, there was a process called betrothal. And back in those days, many uh, parents would select the bride of uh, their, their, their young men, and their, uh, you know, th th they would set it up. It would be an arranged marriage that was true in many cases back in that day. All of us have been selected by Christ to be in His kingdom, to be in His family, to be in His church. Now, here's the big question. If you are a born-again believer, if you have your name on the rolls of some church somewhere, whether it's Faith Church or whether it's, uh, you know, First Baptist uh, somewhere or something other, no matter where it is, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you are currently engaged to Jesus. He is the groom, and you are the bride. Now, there are no brides who are brides all by themselves because there is a wedding party. There is a wedding family, and you need to understand that because when a person gets married, they get married to a whole family. They get married to whatever his people are, and your people, woman, they're all a part of the same group, so it becomes one family. That's magic isn't it? Well, it's supernatural for sure, because when that couple hooks up, when they get together, they are one, and the families become one. They are united. But we need to understand where we are today. What's our situation with Jesus Christ? If we're engaged, where is our groom? If we're engaged, where is the person who made these promises to us? And he did make us some promises, didn't he? Well, I think he did. Because look back on it when you gave your life to Christ. You made an absolute commitment. You made a promise that you were going to follow him, that you were going to be a part of his church, that you were going to be a part of his family. And as a result, you were going to act like the folks in the church are supposed to behave. When you became a member of the church, you promised God that you were going to worship together with his people. If you're not doing that, you're not being a good engaged person. It's just like being engaged to somebody. Your spouse goes off to fight in a war somewhere, and you become an idolater. You become a, a player. You become a person who is not committed to that person that you're engaged to. Jesus Christ has left, and he has departed 
the physical presence of this world. He left a spirit behind. He left his holy comforter behind. But Jesus himself is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Well, what's he doing there? Why did he go? What happened? Well, we need to go back to the New Testament and the Gospel of John, uh, the 14th chapter and the second verse. And here is what it says. In my Father's house are many mansions. You've heard that a bunch of times. And if it were not so, would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. Now think about this for a minute, because you need to look at it from a historical perspective and how um, Jewish people handled weddings uh, back in that day. The bride and groom would become engaged or betrothed, which is our present condition. We made vows to each other, and the only way that we who are engaged or betrothed could get separated from each other, we actually had to go through a divorce. We had to go get a divorce, even though we have not had the wedding or the honeymoon yet. Isn't that something? And so that was a real commitment, and that's the way the body of Christ is right now. We are betrothed. We are engaged to Jesus. Now, Jesus said in the Gospel of John, 14 chapter, second verse, he said, I'm going back to my father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. Well, that's nothing but history, because that is exactly what happened in the Jewish family. When a couple got betrothed, the son or the groom would go back to his father's house, wherever that father's house was, and that person would build on to his father's house a place for his bride and him. They would even anticipate the birth of children and they would have some add-ons. Can you imagine that? I mean, if you had six boys, and they brought all those grandchildren in there, and they brought those wives in there, that's how come it was so important for everyone to realize that it wasn't just the man and the woman getting married, but it was both families getting married, because they were going to be living essentially under the same roof. They were going to be in the same place. And as a result, they had to plan to get along. So Jesus, the bridegroom, is at his father's house, which is in heaven, and he is preparing a place for the bride, us, to come and to live with him. Now, eventually, we don't know when, he is coming back and he's going to receive us. He's going to come and he is going to usher us back to the place where God is. I mean, isn't that great? I mean, if you are single today, you have a wedding to plan for. God has promised you that there is a wedding that you're going to plan for. So if Jesus, the groom, is in heaven and he's preparing a place for us, well, what are we doing? What is the bride doing? And remember that the bride is the collective church. It is every member of the church, every saved and sanctified member of the church. Now, nobody gets married without a whole bunch of people helping out, and more so today than ever before. I can remember when my, both of my daughters got married, man, you had the caterers, you had the makeup artists, you had the people preparing the dress, you had everything. I mean, you had a nation preparing for that wedding. And the same thing is true today. Everybody in the body of Christ has a part to play in the preparation for the wedding. Because the church, the bride, is supposed to be presented when Jesus comes back without spot or blemish. Without spot or blemish. Now, let me tell you something. The church is going to be all jacked up if... Everybody is not playing their position. If every person in the body of Christ is not playing their position, when Jesus comes back, the church is not going to be in the place where it's supposed to be. And mercy. If everybody is not doing their part, then the bride is really not going to be functional as a ready bride when Jesus comes back. Now let's think about it. Think about all the things that have to go on when a bride is getting ready. <clears throat> Man, she's getting her beautiful dress on. 
she's putting on, we're going to talk about that dress in a minute because the dress is not just white linen. The dress is not just white light lace. There's a meaning for that. And what the meaning is are righteous deeds. That's what the dress means. When we do righteous deeds, that is our covering. That is our dress when we are the bride of Christ. Man, don't worry about whether it's a wang or whether it is uh, whatever the name of the dress is. Forget that. Forget, a, forget about that part and focus on what are you doing. Now, Pastor, are you saying that <coughs> in order for us to, you know, be accepted by Jesus Christ? Have we got to do these righteous deeds? No, you don't have to do it to get saved. That was done in the betrothal. That was done in the engagement. When you and Christ had that conversation, when you had that little talk with Jesus one day, and you told him that you would follow him, when he told you that he would be with you for the rest of your life, that was that was the exchange of the promises. That was the exchange of the vows. Now, what he's doing is he's keeping his part of the bargain. He's going to prepare a place for you. You are supposed to be, and I am supposed to be, doing the things that we promised Jesus that we were going to do. Well, what did we promise? We promised that we were not going to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are going to gather in the name of Jesus to listen to the word of God, to sing his holy praises, and to worship him. And if we don't do all of that, then he's keeping his promise, but we're not keeping our promise. We also promised him that we were going to honor him with our tithes and our offerings, that we were going to pour in to his kingdom. We were going to bring everything we had into the storehouse. We had talent, we're going to use the talent. If we had treasure, we were going to pour in the treasure. Nobody was going to be without because we understand and recognize that in the betrothal, when we give up to help others in the body of Christ, what we're doing is we are blessing God. And we are saying to God, I have faith in you, Father, that what I have is not the end of what I'm going to get because I understand that I am an heir with you and joint heir with Jesus Christ because we hooked up. We're married. And because we are married, my money is not going to run out. My time is not going to run out. My energy is not going to run out. Isn't that great? It's great to know that that's the promise that God gave to you and to me. That's great. So Jesus is there, we are here, and we are separated, but we, you know, you wouldn't be separated from your groom if you knew you were going to be getting married. I mean, you wouldn't see each other every day, and you wouldn't go out and have dinner, but you know what? You'd still have communication. You know, I don't know what they how they communicated back then, but I suspect they had letters or couriers or something. I don't think they had email or Facebook, but they communicated. They were in touch with each other. We are in touch with Jesus today. We don't know when he's coming back, but that doesn't mean we don't get a chance to talk to him. We talk to him every single day through prayer. He writes us love letters, and we call it the Bible. And he has communicated back to us and is communicating back to us the truth of his love for us down through the ages. Separated, apart, God is doing his part through Jesus. We're doing our part as a member of the body of Christ, and we're working with the members of the body of Christ. Everybody has a place. Everybody has a position. Everybody has a responsibility to make sure when Jesus comes back, the bride is ready and prepared, making sure that she smells good, making sure that she looks good, making sure that she is crisp and clean and pure. And ladies and gentlemen, everybody ain't doing their part. Everybody is not doing their part. There are some who are just hanging out waiting on the feast. But if you're just hanging out waiting on the feast, then you're not going to be enjoying the feast. 
because only the people who are involved in the process are going to get an invitation to the wedding feast. Now, Pastor, is that really going to happen? Is that really coming? Well, I, I think it is. We find out in the book of Revelation that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back in an amazing way. First of all, he's going to come back, and he's going to take care of all of his enemies. All of those folks who were bold and obnoxious in their conversation about there ain't no God. All those people who said, you know, it's silly, you know, I worship a spirit. I worship, uh, you know, I worship some other kind of God. I love the church, but I don't love the Jesus, or I love Jesus, I don't love the church. It doesn't work like that, because you got to take the whole deal. you got to take God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now, please, don't get confused with branding. Don't get confused with denominationalism. But get concerned about whether or not your name is recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just make sure that you have had a personal uh, engagement with Jesus Christ. If you spend your whole day sipping margaritas and watching the soap operas, listen, you are wasting an opportunity to have a relationship with Christ. And if the only intimacy that you have is with Andy Griffith, you got a problem. If the only intimacy you have is with the have and the have-nots, then you got a real serious problem because God wants his bride to be connected to him. He wants his bride to be in a tight and close and constant relationship with him. Now, this is what I'm looking forward to. A lot of people are worried because, you know, they're, they're saying right now that these are the last days. Well, they are the last days. You know, it's not the beginning of the last days. We're smack dab in the middle of the last days. But don't worry about that. Don't worry about it because that's a good thing. That is a wonderful thing because all of us, at some point in time are going to die. All of us at some point in time are going to have to give an account of who we are and what we have done and what we have failed to do. And, you know, that's all going to happen. So if we're living in the last days, and we are, don't look at it like, oh, the world's going to come to an end. Or don't look at it like, you know, a big ball of fire is going to come down and destroy the earth. Don't worry about that part. Here's what you should be focusing on. The groom is coming back. He promised he was going to go and prepare a place for you, and he's coming back now to receive it. But, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I, I think I may die before, you know, he comes back. No, 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 no. He's just going to put you into a sort of a hotel, and he's going to call the name of that place you know, paradise, and you're going to be chilling out in paradise waiting on him to give you the message to get up. You know, come on, I'm, I, the bus is here. Come on, let's go. But here's what's happening. Jesus, in these last days, and we know they're the last days because look around you and look at what's happening. Everything that, uh, that the Word of God talks about in terms of the last days, they're, they're happening right now. They're happening today. When we look around, there are extremities in weather. I mean, a hurricane today is a whole lot than what a hurricane was, you know, uh, you know 300 years ago. A uh, tornado is, they're more frequent, they're more violent. You know, we have fires every year, all year, in many parts of the country, in many parts of the world. Earthquakes are just happening every day. We have plagues of disease that we don't understand. You know, this, you know, coronavirus is something that we still don't understand. And I know some people say there's a, uh, there's a vaccine out there. And, and I praise God that there is a vaccine that we're going to discover. But ladies and gentlemen, this thing is mutating so crazily fast that it is just hard to even imagine that it is not something that is supernatural. Don't get me wrong now. I am not saying that God sent the disease. I think that our sin brought the disease, and I believe that God has given us grace throughout it, but 
I just believe that this is just a sign of Jesus is coming back soon. I mean, things are ramping up, and he's coming back. But once again, I'm not worried about it. I'm, I'm pretty excited because it's about to become that wedding day. And when we go to the book of Revelation, here's what we see in chapter 21. Here's what it says. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. Now let's stop right there and let's think about this for a minute. Now, <clears throat> a new heaven and a new earth tells me something really awesome. And I've never thought about this before, but God showed me in Scripture that this is really what it is. A new heaven, that means that you know, the heaven that was will be no longer. The earth that was is no longer because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Wouldn't, wouldn't do or say that there was going to be a new heaven and a new earth if they were going to be just passed away and nothing else was going to exist. So look at the rest of the scripture. Here's what it says. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. We're living on the first earth. Jesus is living in the first heaven. Those are going to be passed away. Now look at the remainder of the verse. Also, there was no more sea. So everything that is now is passing away. Everything that is now is passing away. All the things that you enjoy now, they're slipping away from you. Now look at verse 2. Then I, John, saw the city, and he referred to the sun as New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, and this heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, it was not a bride. It was an actual physical city that John saw. He said it was a new Jerusalem. It's not the old Jerusalem because the old Jerusalem was destroyed. Now look at verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from, say, from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now, come on, this is good. Come on, you need to hear this. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. You see that? All of this activity... All of this renovation, all of this destruction is not just destruction for the sake of destruction. God is tearing down, but God is also building up. That same thing is taking place in your life, Christian. That same stuff is taking place in your environment right now. Your body, which feels beaten up, and your body, which feels tired, that financial situation that has beaten you down and worried you and frustrated you, that old stuff is being broken down, and God is going to do a new thing. Now, hang on. We're going to get to where he specifically promises that. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, all this time before now, we were talking about Jesus, but now we're talking about God. But don't forget, God is God the Father, God is God the Son, and God is God the Holy Spirit. But now we're going to be with the person of God as the ruler, the judge, God, the Father. Now look at the rest of it, verse 4. And God will wipe away every tear. <laughs> there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. And there is so much death right now. There is so much crying right now in the body of Christ, in the world, in good places, in bad places. There's a lot of struggle. But when New Jerusalem comes down, when this new city is created, when this new heaven is created, God is going to be in charge. And God is going to have a period. He's going to have a period and that period is going to be called the wedding feast. And that period is what we kind of refer to as the millennium. And what we need to look back at 
is that marriage situation that we were talking about a minute ago. You know, when people get married, they go on a honeymoon. Jesus is going to have a honeymoon with his people. And that honeymoon is going to be a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is going to be physically in charge. He is going to be the ruling king. And during this period of time, he's going to put the devil in check. He's going to get all of the presidents and all of the prime ministers and all of the kings and all of the world leaders who have tried over a period of time to debunk him. Just like the rulers in China have been taking away religious symbols in just the way many places have been persecuting Christians, Jesus is going to come back for payback. And when you understand that, we will understand why we got that 1,000-year period of time. Now, let me tell you something. I'm going to be ruling in the new heaven and the new earth. I'm not going to be here during that period of tribulation when all the trouble, when all hell has broken loose. I'm not going to be here. I am going to be sitting ready to be a part of the administrative team of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, we're going to wrap it up and we say, share this with you. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. All old stuff's passed away. COVID-19 is going to be passed away. Debtor's court's going to be passed away. Bankruptcy is going to be passed away. Divorce is going to be passed away. Sickness, cancer, everything that is evil, wicked, and ungodly is going to be passed away. I am so glad that this is going to happen. But ladies and gentlemen, that's the reason we ought to be looking forward to the wedding feast of the Lamb, making sure that we get to be a part of it. Because finally, verse 5, Then he who sat on the, the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. I don't know about you. I'm ready for some new stuff. I'm ready for some new things. I'm ready for God to make my broken down body new. I'm waiting for God to make my broken down relationships new. I'm waiting on God to make my broken down hopes and dreams brand new. And that is what God is promising to do because he is not a bad husband but he's a good husband, and I am willing to submit myself to him because I am a part of the bride of Christ, and I am waiting on the honeymoon, and Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is on his way back, and when he gets here, all of my enemies will become his enemies, and he's going to take them out. All of those who ridiculed Jesus and all of those who ridiculed us for being his children, he's going to take them out too. And they're going to spend eternity with their father, the devil. And we're going to spend our eternity in heaven with Christ. Amen? Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, God has blessed us in a in a lot of ways, and most importantly, he has blessed us with the betrothal or the engagement that consists of all the promises that he has made to us. And importantly, it also consists of all the promises that we have made to him. And here's my question for you today. Are you keeping your wedding vows to Christ? Are you? Are you keeping your wedding vows to be faithful to him? Have any idols in your life? You got any boyfriends, girlfriends in your little black book that you still talk to? Man, come on, let's get it straight. He is a good bride, good, hug, good groom. You be a good bride. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, Father for the engagement that you have with us. I pray, Father, I'm praying for somebody right now who is 
out of hope, out of help, thinking that they are alone in the world by themselves and this is the way it's always going to be, thinking that things are not going to get better, that they're going to get worse. Father, send an angel to tell them right now, you make all things new, even those broken down, messed up, old rotten lives, they're all going to be made brand new. In the name of Jesus, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you, and I pray that God would prepare you for the for wedding feast of the Lamb, and that you would enjoy your honeymoon with Him. I want to ask you to do me a favor. I really need to hear from you. I need for you to either go on social media, go to our Instagram page, or go to Facebook, or go to our website, and just leave a word. Just leave a word and say something like this. Pastor, we are blessed by what the volunteers at Faith Church are doing uh, to bring the word every week. And ask yourself the question, what can I do to help? But just send the word. Would you do that? Amen. Well, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on the YouTube channel, Faith Church, faithchurchoxmore.org. I almost couldn't remember. God bless you. We'll see you next week.